Welcome everybody to lecture three of week one where we go over the basics of the gunpowder revolution and how it not only laid the foundation for the modern arms trade and production system but also laid the foundation for the modern state. The gunpowder revolution set everything into motion. It began and created the foundation of the modern arms trade and production system but also created the foundations of the modern state. Now, as the name states, this revolution was precipitated by the large-scale adoption of gunpowder and warfare, primarily with the examples of cannon and handheld gunpowder arms like the arquebus. Now, although the exact date is a bit murky, most historians tend to agree that the gunpowder revolution began roughly around the year 1400. Cannon and other gunpowder arms marked a watershed moment in military technology. They represented a monumental leap over all other technology being fielded on the battlefield at that point in time. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Gunpowder has been used for hundreds of years prior to the 1400s, so why is he making a big deal about it now? Well, yeah, it had been fielded prior to the 1400s. But although it had been fielded, large-scale use of cannon and gunpowder was still relatively scant. Now, the reason for this is twofold. Number one, cannon were incredibly expensive to make. It took a lot of time, took a lot of money, and took a lot of resources to make just one cannon. Not everybody could do it. Much less, even if they could, they probably couldn't make a whole lot. And number two, cannon and gunpowder required specialized training. The traditional way of trying to form an army during this period in the 1400s and prior was you basically just drafted serfs off of the farmland. These are unskilled soldiers. You couldn't have an unskilled person trying to operate a cannon, right? Bad things tend to happen. Therefore, any ruler at that point in time that wanted to utilize this new technology needed to acquire not just large sums of money, but they needed to create a pool of trained professionals to use this new technology in warfare. Now steps in King Charles VII of France. He would institute taxation and create a standing army. Let's look how we did it. Charles VII was the King of France from roughly 1422 to 1461, which happened to be an incredibly tumultuous time in European history. The Hundred Years' War was in its ending phases, and Charles VII wanted to once and for all put a nail in the coffin to British continental possessions in France. Most armies at this point in time were either assembled by nobles within the affected areas, or they were composed of mercenaries that rented out their services. The Hundred Years' War had been going on for so long that by the time the conflict began to wane, there were a lot of unemployed mercenaries roaming around the French countryside doing whatever they wanted to to get money. So without conflict to profit on, these mercenaries often turned their skills to more nefarious activities, such as kidnapping, extortion, and just plain pillaging an area to make money. So Charles VII, Eager to put an end to the Hundred Years' War and the mercenaries that were killing his own people, went to the French legislature in 1439 and established two key pieces of legislation. One was legislation which said that military recruitment and training was restricted to the king and the king alone. And number two, he established a tax or tale to pay for the establishment of a new royal French army which happened to be made up of most of the mercenary forces in the country if they were, after they were given the option to either join or die. This ultimately resulted in a nationally funded standing army of 6,000 soldiers, all united under one national flag, the first in the world. Now let's go back to the subject of gunpowder and cannon. The cannon had already seen limited use in the Hundred Years' War, but at this point in time, most cannon were rods welded together in a cylinder and they fired stone cannonballs. Needless to say, they were powerful, but not all that reliable. Now, the, the tally, or the taxation, that Charles VII had put in place changed the game. It allowed the French king to pay for additional cannon and also pay for the trained troops in the standing army to utilize the cannon to great effect. The difficult part of all of this wasn't how to build cannon or refine gunpowder, but how to collect all of that tax money. In order to accomplish this, the king established a bureaucratic system of taxation around the country in order to collect all of the tax money to be sent back to the king. 
Now think about the effect that that had. It centralized the king's power. It also centralized the power of the state. In many ways, file cabinets tend to follow firearms. Now let's go ahead and fast forward a bit. Let's go ahead and fast forward two French kings. So now we're at the reign of Charles VIII. Now, although the Talley provided the French monarchy with massive financial power and military power, nobody up to that point in time had really utilized all of it. Charles would change everything. He felt all that power and he wanted to use it. So with all the tax money, Charles expanded both the army and the arsenal of cannon. Also, by this time, better met metalworking techniques had produced cannon that were reliable and lighter than previous generations of cannon. And by the way, the cannonball was now made of iron and could even be made to explode by filling the ball with gunpowder. With all this power, Charles VIII decided to invade the Italian states in 1494. France entered Italy with around 25,000 troops and 140 cannon. The Italian city-states had never seen an army of such number, nor of such advanced technology. Italy, yes, had cannon, but not in the number or quality that France possessed. Most Italian states surrendered to Charles just after seeing this massive concentration of military power. The force of the cannon was also so great that the Neapolitan fortress of Monte San Giovanni, which stood once with holding a siege of seven years, fell to the French cannon in just eight hours. French forces eventually left it Italy after European kingdoms had ganged up and threatened to cut Charles' for forces off. But that was after four years of being in the country. And after those four years, the French left much richer than they had arrived. The Italian wars were massively consequential to both the state and the military arms production and trade system. The massive force that France was able to build scared the hell out of all the other major powers in Europe. Soon after, kingdoms such as Spain followed a similar path to state formation, establishing systems of taxation to pay for both cannon and troops, and having the effect of further centralizing power to the king and the state. Now, just a side note, we also have to highlight how the structure of political power is being affected by cannon and gunpowder. First, the push to establish standing armies took power away from the nobility. Usually, it was the nobility who was called upon by the monarch to form an army with soldiers under the employment of a noble, not the king. A standing army meant that the king no longer had to go out to the nobles within his realm and beg for an army. He could provide the army himself. Second, other firearms such as, the ar such as the arquebus were also being fielded that effectively proletarianized combat. Before then, the greatest military unit was the knight, which was essentially gathered into a cavalry which was primarily made up of nobility. Now one person, usually not a nobleman, could effectively wield as much power as an entire group of noble knights. And third, most people in a given mon monarchy did not see themselves as loyal to a king. They were loyal to the landed noble who paid them, and when they went to war, even if it was ultimately for the king, they would fight under the flag of the nobility in which they farmed under. Now with the establishment of a standing army, all soldiers fought under one flag, and a sense of national identity began to take hold. People began to see them selves as nationally French at that point in time. That's a huge change in the creation and the formation of the modern state. Now let's review the important aspects of the arms trade and production system during the gunpowder revolution. The primary producers during this period at first were the Italians, but the Italian city-states, although technologically advanced, did not have access to all of the raw material needed to produce cannon and gunpowder. So in the beginning, they usually just imported those raw re resources. However, over time, states that had access to the raw material, like France, like Germany, and at that time they were referred to as the Lowlands and the English, eventually overtook Italian production of gunpowder arms. 
Now, er early in this period, the trade in arms was a rare occurrence, partially because most states that possessed cannon didn't want to be shot at with their own goods. It never looks good, right? But it was also because cannon were difficult to produce, so most states didn't have the excess production to be willing to trade it away. Later, states that could produce an cannon at an excess of state requirements began to actively establish restrictive export policies. So England, for exa example, got really good at producing cannon. However, restrictive policies were beginning to be put into place. Elizabeth I ordered that gun production be limited to the amount needed only for the use of the realm. Even though gun producers warned that without the funds, workers would go elsewhere. This is an important point. This leads us to the pattern of innovation and diffusion. Now, although the trade in cannon was relatively small, the main trade was in skilled labor to produce the cannon. The demand for skilled labor was high, as almost every kingdom in Europe sought to build its own supply of arms to protect itself. The result was a diffusion of technology across Europe. The technologies of making cast iron cannon, once the purview of the English cannon makers alone, quickly diffused throughout Europe as a result of the peace between England and Spain and the restriction of cannon building in 1574 by Queen Elizabeth. Now, innovation during this period was relatively slow, primarily due to the fact that production of anything besides raw goods in this period was intensive and expensive. This resulted in relatively little change in military arms during this period. For example, the Brown Bess was the primary firearm of the British Army from 1690 all the way to 1840. Can you believe that? And the Sovereign of the Seas, a war-fighting br British vessel, looked almost exactly like a warship being launched in 1860. Now, take into account that the Sovereign of the Seas was launched in the 1500s. Now, this isn't to say that military innovation wasn't occurring in this period. It was, but it was mostly incremental and small. It didn't change the production techniques all that much, and overarching changes in technology didn't occur at a rapid pace. That was until the invented invention of the steam-powered machine.